um, the, FAPE, um, the FAPE program for, in NOAA. So today, um, I'll be presenting my research focused on estimating survival of um, larval Atlantic bluefin tuna in the Gulf of Mexico using a three-dimensional ocean modeling framework. Quantifying larval survival is important not only for the management of, of Atlantic bluefin, but for the management of other species as well, because it directly impacts the number of individuals that are entering a fishery each year. Currently, um, larval survival can't be estimated in the field using traditional field sampling methods, and this makes it difficult for fisheries management to set appropriate fishing limits. One of the main takeaways from my presentation today is that ocean models offer a potentially valuable tool for future fisheries management to incorporate a more ecosystem-based management approach for um, species like Atlantic bluefin. So Atlantic bluefin are large pelagic fish that are in the family Scombridae, along with other species of tuna, mackerel, and bonito. They function as top predators within the ecosystem, feeding primarily on baitfish. In addition to Atlantic bluefin, there's also the Pacific and Southern bluefin. Of the three, Atlantic bluefin grow to the largest sizes. Adults can grow to more than three meters in length and weigh over 600 kilograms, so quite impressive sizes, as you can see off to the left. The species is found mainly in temperate regions, um, as you can see in the, uh, the map off to the right, where we have North America on the left, Europe and Africa on the right, and where pink denotes the um, habitat of Atlantic bluefin. Bluefin are unique to teleos fish in that they possess a highly specialized cardiovascular system, which um, allows them to regulate body temperature. This explains how they're able to exploit ecosystems with such a wide range in temperature. The species has two genetically distinct populations, one that spawns in the Gulf of Mexico during spring and one that spawns in the Mediterranean closer to summer. And this has led management to divide the species into a Western stock and an Eastern stock. I'll be talking about the Western stock. The Atlantic bluefin tuna fishery is highly lucrative. One individual can sell for more than $100,000. Historically, this has led to the stock being heavily overfished. Off to the right, you can see a time series where I have spawning stock biomass on the y-axis, which is a uh, proxy for total biomass of the stock. And on the x-axis, we have year from 1970 to um, 2007. What you can see is that just from 1970 to 1985, a little over a decade, the um, stock biomass decreased by 80%. In uh, response to this, a stock rebuilding plan was implemented, implemented in the early 1980s. However, the stock has remained near these levels since, and this is because, unfortunately, Atlantic bluefin are a, are a slow-growing species that can live up to 40 years. So this highlights the importance for management to make um, long-term decisions. To set sustainable fishing limits, managers must consider three factors. The first is growth, which is somatic growth of the individuals that are already in the fishery, um, natural mortality, and then recruitment, which is defined as the number of new individuals entering a fishery. The first two are considered to be fairly constant, apart from large, um, large shifts in the productivity of an ecosystem or an event like an oil spill. By contrast, recruitment is known to be highly variable. Here I'm showing a figure of the um, Western Atlantic um, stock recruitment, where on the y-axis we have the number of age one fish in thousands, and on the x-axis we have year. The two different lines represent two different stock assessments, and the difference between these models is not important. What is important is that you can see that recruitment varies by a factor of two to three. It's also important to note that recruitment is revealed in hindcast. However, for fisheries management to set appropriate limits, they need some estimate of future recruitment. And to do this, they use a stock recruitment relationship. Here I'm showing some of the classic stock recruitment relationships, the Ricker type, Power type, Beverton Holt type. And these relationships take spawning stock biomass and relate it to recruitment. These have been widely used in fisheries management because they're um, quite straightforward to, to estimate spawning stock biomass. However, these relationships have historically broken down because they don't include a lot of realism and they neglect other factors that influence recruitment. One of those factors is larval survival. Mortality during the larval stage is incredibly high, ranging from 0.1 to roughly 0.5 per day. 
survival is typically estimated to be less than 1%. So slight changes in this 1% can have um, really measurable impacts on a, uh, on a stock. <coughs> Sources of larval mortality include predation, starvation, advection-based losses. And for this talk, um, and in my re research, I've focused on predation and starvation. Advection-based losses are not thought to be um, particularly important for um, pelagic species like bluefin. Um, they're usually more, it's usually more important for coastal species that needs a specific substrate for settlement. In particular, um, starvation is thought to be important in the Gulf of Mexico. During the stock spawning period, temperatures can exceed um, greater than 30 degrees Celsius, resulting in high metabolic rates. The region is also highly patchy, ranging over three orders of magnitude, where chlorophyll ranges over three orders of magnitude. You can see off to the left here is an image of surface chlorophyll. And this patchiness is mainly driven by the entrainment of high um, chlorophyll shelf water off into the open ocean Gulf of Mexico by mesoscale features. Starvation is thought to be particularly high um, when individuals switch from feeding on yolk reserves to feeding on zooplankton. Off to the right, I'm showing a theoretical a diagram of theoretical larval fish survival, where on the x-axis we have age, on the y-axis we have population. The gray denotes the time that individuals are feeding on yolk, and um, you see a, um, a, a period called the critical period where there's uh, an increase in mortality, and this is thought to do, be due to starvation. Nevertheless, tuna spawn in this region. So that brings me to the first question of my research, which is what is the relative importance of starvation and predation for larval survival? There must be some trade-off um, that can explain why um, bluefin spawn here. What regions of the Gulf of Mexico are favorable for larval survival? And the last question I'm interested in is how is future climate likely to impact larval survival? So to answer these questions, uh, in chapter one of my dissertation, I developed a physical biogeochemical model to estimate zooplankton biomass, which we then used to um, simulate prey fields for larval tuna. In chapter two, I developed a Lagrangian individual-based larval fish model, and we used this to explicitly estimate mortality along larval trajectories. And then finally, in chapter three, I applied a downscaled climate simulation to investigate the impacts of future climate on larval dynamics. Next, I will talk about the development of the physical biogeochemical model. So the physical modeling framework included running offline tracer advection simulation, simulations using MIT general circulation model. We used dynamical fields, three-dimensional velocity, temperature, and salinity provided by a data assimilative HICOM simulation that was run from 1993 to 2012. The model is four kilometer resolution and we use daily average fields. Offline modeling allows for longer time steps, which reduces computational costs. This is particularly important for um, running biogeochemical simulations because as you'll see in a moment, they often have many three-dimensional tracer fields that need to be advected each time step. So running offline allows us to run the physics ones and then we can recycle this when we tune the biogeochemical model. To simulate the lower trophic level ecosystem in the Gulf of Mexico, I'm using the model NEMRO. NEMRO is a concentration-based functional group biogeochemical model. It contains 11 state variables with two uh, forms of inorganic nitrate, nitrogen, two forms of organic nitrogen, dissolved and particulate, and also includes silica. The phytoplankton community is represented by two state variables, small phytoplankton and large phytoplankton. Small phytoplankton represent things like cyanobacteria and picoeukaryotes. Large phytoplankton represent things like diatoms. And the zooplankton community is represented <laughs> using three zooplankton state variables. The first is small zooplankton or microzooplankton, such as ciliates. Large zooplankton, which represent copepods and predatory zooplankton, which are things like predatory copepods ranging from one to five millimeters in size. It's important to note that this model is well suited for my research. Oftentimes, biogeochemical models will only have one zooplankton state variable. So this model allows us to estimate realistic prey fields for larval tuna. So here I'm showing an example of some model output. This is surface chlorophyll, which is the proxy for total phytoplankton biomass. 
What you can see is that the model is doing a good job at estimating realistic concentrations of surface chlorophyll in the open ocean Gulf of Mexico and on the shelf. We also see dynamics that we would expect to find, such as upwelling off the Yucatan Peninsula. It's important to validate um, biogeochemical models because the parameters can vary by an order of magnitude. Oftentimes validation is focused on surface chlorophyll, which as I uh, just mentioned is a proxy for phytoplankton biomass. However, in the ocean, phytoplankton biomass is a residual between phytoplankton growth and zooplankton grazing. This means that it's entirely possible for, for models to reproduce realistic surface chlorophyll but get the internal dynamics wrong. Fortunately, over my PhD, I've had the opportunity to be part of a um, be part of process study cruises that went out in the Gulf of Mexico during May of 2017 and May of 2018. And we went out and measured as many of these rates as we could to validate the model. We would collect water from Niskin bottles tripped at various depths, as you can see off the bottom right from that rosette. And we would use these samples to perform onboard incubations under different light conditions and also in situ incubations. We measured things like phytoplankton growth rates, microzooplankton grazing rates, size fractionated mesozooplankton grazing rates, uh, in situ chlorophyll measurements, also looking at the DCM, and finally, size fractionated mesozooplankton biomass. This last uh, quantity is particularly important because mesozooplankton is the primary food for larval tuna. Because of this, I also validated the model using mesozooplankton biomass that had been measured for over three decades in the Gulf of Mexico by the Southeast Area Monitoring Assessment Program, or CMAP. The CMAP program goes out twice a year, once in the um, spring and once in fall, and they conduct um, plankton toes, as you can see up here, using bongo nets. And off to the right, you can see an example of what it would might, what the mesozooplankton biomass might look like. It looks kind of almost like there's sand there. The sampling from the program covers the northern Gulf of Mexico, and this provides a powerful model constraint um, that we can use to validate the model. So here I'm showing some model data comparison. Off to the left, we have the CMAP observations. The top left panel is the average of the CMAP observations in units of milligrams of carbon per meter cubed. And the panel directly below that is in log 10 space. To the right is the, the comparisons for the model. And what we can see is the model predicts a realistic mesozooplankton biomass in both the open ocean and shelf region. It's also important to note that the model is found to resolve the dominant spatial variability with a correlation of 0 0.9. Um, over the course of my PhD, I spent a considerable amount of time tuning this model, developing this model, and for the sake of time, I won't go into all of the details of the validation, but if you're interested, I have a um, publication that um, was recently submitted to Biogeosciences, and if you are interested, you can look there. So now that we have a model that estimates realistic zooplankton biomass, we need to know, well, what are larval tuna actually eating? Fortunately, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with some people at Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, here I'm showing an image of larval tuna st stomach contents. So at the top, we have a larval tuna. Off to the left, we have a stomach. And then to the right is the actual stomach contents. And the gut contents were analyzed for both the size of the prey and the taxonomy of what larval tuna are actually eating. This was done for over 200 larvae. To the right, I'm showing a summary of that data. On the x-axis, we have larval length, and on the y-axis, we have prey length. I used this data to define upper and lower bounds for the prey size range. With this data, along with the estimates from our model, we can get um, an estimate of the proportion of the biomass that's actually available to the larval tuna. So now that I've developed a physical biogeochemical model to estimate zooplankton biomass, the next thing I did was to develop a Lagrangian individual-based larval fish model to explicitly estimate mortality along larval trajectories. To do this, I started with um, running one Lagrangian simulations using the MIT GCM float package. I initialized particles in, um, in, a in proportion to a larval habitat index by Dominguez et al. 2016. 
This index includes temperature, sea surface height, and geostrophic velocity and relates those quantities back to where larvae have been found previously. We initialized the particles between April 1st to June 30th, which is the spawning period, roughly the spawning period for Atlantic bluefin. And we did this for 20 years over 1993 to 2012. Each particle is tracked for three weeks with six hourly output. So now we have a model that has realistic zooplankton biomass and realistic larval trajectories. The next thing we need to do is estimate growth. Growth is important because it's closely connected to survival. If individuals do not grow, they will eventually starve. And slower growing individuals are thought to experience higher predation because they have large, longer pelagic larval durations. To estimate growth, we need to know two terms. The first is assimilate ingestion, and the, um, the second is metabolic requirement. So next I will discuss how I um, estimate assimilate ingestion. So here we have an example trajectory. If we zoom in to a grid cell, it might look like this, where we have some concentrations of nutrients. We have the phytoplankton eating the new, uh, uptaking the nutrients. We have the zooplankton eating the phytoplankton. So these concentrations are all changing due to the biogeochemical model. And concentrations are also changing due to the advection, which are denoted in the blue arrows there. So we have some uh, larvae located here, and we want to know, well, what is the ingestion of this individual? To estimate that, I'm using this equation here. The first term is a 2D perception field, where the first parameter is phi, and that's the fraction of the 2D field that the individual can actually perceive. We know that the eyes of larvae are often located towards the top of the head, and so they don't effectively see prey below them. R is the sensory radius. We then multiply this by the cruising swimming speed and by the daily feeding duration. This gives us an estimate of volume perceived, which is on the order of about 10 of tens of liters per day. We then multiply this by the model estimated zooplankton concentration, and this gives us an estimate of prey encounter rate. Finally, we multiply this by the capture success and assimilation efficiency. These are assumed to be constants in the equation, and here are our variables. Zooplankton concentration is estimated by the model, as I've mentioned. The swimming speed um, scales with length. This has been shown consistently in laboratory studies. And it's typically something around one to two body lengths per second on average. So this leaves the sensory radius, which is a, uh, will be a sensitive parameter because it's a squared term and it's also highly variable um, depending on things like prey size. To estimate the sensory radius, it's first important to understand how vision works. So just like in humans, larval tuna have binocular vision. This starts with some amount of light that reflects off a prey image, enters the cornea, which is then concentrated onto the lens of the eye, and then this is further concentrated onto the retina. The size of the final image will depend on the size of the prey and, the, and its distance. A common way to quantify visual acuity in animals is through the minimum separable angle approach. And in this approach, the density of photoreceptors on the retina is used to estimate the smallest possible image that can be detected. Fortunately for me, this has been recently estimated by Hilder et al. 2019. Here I'm showing a cross section of an eye of a larval bluefin. They estimated um, the minimum separable angle as a function of larval length. And as you can see, the MSA decreases as the length increases, and this is due to the fact that as individuals grow, they, their vision becomes more developed. So if we think about how this applies to our modeling um, framework, here I'm showing larval, uh, an, a schematic of a larval tuna in an XZ space, where the brown is the field of view and the red is the minimum separable angle. And if we know the prey length, which we can take, get from the gut content data, we can estimate the maximum reactive distance. And what we're really interested in is the sensory radius. And uh, fortunately, it's pretty straightforward. The sensory radius equals a ma maximum reactive distance when the field of view is equal to 90 degrees. And this is what we assume for larval tuna. We also include the impact of light and water clarity. These are, um, these are quantities that are estimated by the biogeochemical model. So now we have a relatively simple equation to estimate assimilated ingestion, where the sensory radius is now dependent on the size of the, lar of the larval tuna, the, the length of the prey, 
the ambient light and the water clarity. The next thing we need to do is to estimate the metabolic requirement. And to do this, I'm using weight and age data of, of over 200 larvae collected in the Gulf of Mexico. This data was provided by Estrella Malka and um, Raul Luis Carrion. I used the data and to fit a line of uh, best fit. From this, I estimate metabolic requirement. We take the derivative of that relationship, and this gives us growth and weight. Multiply this by the carbon fraction to convert to units that is used by the model. We then divide by the gross growth efficiency, which gives us an estimate of the total amount of food that they would have had to have eaten to meet, uh, to meet those growth rates. Then we multiply by the simulation um, efficiency minus the gross growth efficiency, which gives us an estimate of the fraction used for metabolic rates. And then finally, multiplied by a temperature scaling term. We know that larval tuna are exothermic, so the temperature in the environment strongly influences their metabolic rates. So this is important to take into account. So now we have two, um, two equations, one for ingestion, one for metabolic requirement. We can use this to form a mechanistic growth equation now, which you see at the bottom. And we can update the weight of each, um, of each particle as it's being ejected along. So here's an example of that. Here I'm showing three um, trajectories where blue denotes the initial position, the red is the trajectory, and the black um, scales with the weight of the larvae. So if we look at the trajectory in the center of the Gulf of Mexico, you can see that the weight continually decreases. This is suggesting that the, the metabolic requirement is higher than ingestion. By contrast, if you look to the left, you see that a, um, the particle is infected near the shelf where there's high zooplankton biomass, and this leads to higher weight, um, increased weight. And then finally to the right, we see a particle that originally has high growth, but then is infected out into the uh, offshore regions that have, um, they're highly ligotrophic, and this leads to lower weight. So we know that starvation happens before weight equals zero. This is true for humans and other animals. So we need some way to relate weight to starvation. And I'll briefly um, draw your attention back to the main question, the first main question that we're interested in, which is what is the relative importance of starvation and predation for larval survival? So to relate weight to um, starvation, um, I again start with weight and age data. The blue line is the average, which is what I use to estimate the metabolic requirement. And the red line is um, defined as an optimal weight at a particular age. And I calculate this using a 95% confidence interval. So the underlying assumption is that as, part, as larvae deviate from this optimal weight, they have a higher um, probability of, exper of experiencing starvation. So we use this as a reference. And we compute a fitness metric where we take the actual weight divided by the predicted optimal at a given age. And um, you're seeing a histogram of that to the left. And then we use a cumulative distribution function to estimate the probability of a larvae having a given fitness or lower. This gives us a, um, a function between zero and one. And then we can scale this by a maximum starvation parameter, which is what you see off to the right here. So now on the x-axis, we have fitness, but it's simulated divided by optimal. And um, on the y-axis, we have starvation. It's also important to note that we include something called the point of no return. This has been noted in laboratory studies, where if individuals reach a certain weight, in our case, we set it to 0.2% um, to 20% of the optimal. It doesn't matter what food they experience, they will ultimately starve. So we include this also in our model. It's also important to include predation. Uh, fortunately for us, predation is estimated on all biological state variables in the biogeochemical model. The ZP state variable is the largest zooplankton state variable, ranging from one to five millimeters. And given its overlap in size with larval tuna, we can use this to approximate predation on larval tuna. Here's a, an example of some model output of the specific mortality on ZP in units of percent per day. And what you can see is that on the shelf, uh, the specific mortality is greater than 10%, whereas in the open ocean Gulf of Mexico, it's more like one to 2%. Predation on ZP in the biogeochemical model is um, modeled uh, using a quadratic mortality term, which implicitly represents the predation 
of a generalized predator whose abundance co-varies with its prey. The M term there is a, a mortality parameter that scales with temperature. We could also write a mechanistic equation for this, where now we explicitly write out the concentration of the predator, which is F there. And you'll notice that the terms to the right are the same as what, um, uh, the same terms that we use to estimate the ingestion for larval tuna. The concentration of ZP cancels, so now we have an equation with just the concentration of the predator. We can also write a similar equation for the, uh, for the mortality of larval tuna under the assumption that the sensory radius will scale with the prey length. So now if we take, um, if we take the, um, the ratio of these two mortalities, we find that all the, all, um, the terms cancel except the sensory radius. And since we know the mortality on ZP, which is estimated by the model, we can use this um, to estimate the predation on larval tuna if we know this ratio of the sensory radius. Since I've already gone into quite a few equations, I won't go into the full derivation. If you're interested, you can look at my dissertation, but you can show that the ratio of the sensory radius is, is approximately equal to the ratio of their lengths. So now we have an equation that we can use to estimate predation in space and time. Here I'm showing um, uh, a figure of that where on the x-axis we have concentration of ZP and where the black lines are, the, uh, are different sized larvae. So one millimeter, two millimeter, four millimeter, and eight millimeter. So now I've developed a formulation for ingestion, metabolic requirement, starvation, and predation. Now we can start to ask more interesting questions, like who lives and who dies. Here are, um, here are an example of three trajectories where the color represents the number of individuals that are associated with the particle. As you can see, as they're being advected along, mortality is reducing that number. Before we look into survival, it's important to first validate the model. To do this, again, I'm using weight and age data where the black dots are the observations. The red line is the model average and the shaded red area is the 95% confidence interval. What you can see is that the model is doing a good job of uh, capturing the relationship between weight and age. This is suggesting that we're getting the balance between ingestion and respiration approximately right. We also uh, validated the model by comparing the diets of simulated larvae to the diets of um, larvae collected in the field. To the right here, I'm showing a, um, a figure. On the x-axis, we have larval length. and On the y-axis, we have the contribution of mesozooplankton in the diet as uh, in units of percent. What you can see is that in the observations and in the model, uh, the, the contribution of mesozooplankton to the diet increases over time. So larvae are feeding less on microzooplankton. What you'll notice though is that the model consistently underestimates the um, contribution of mesozooplankton. Now this could be an issue with the model. For instance, we don't include, explicitly include handling time in, uh, in our model, so this could potentially lead to some error. Um, there could also be biases in the measurements because it is, it is well known that, um, that soft-bodied aborted ciliates are often underrepresented in, the dot, in gut content data. So it's possible that the model is actually um, is actually representing a more realistic diet of larval tuna. So this is really the first um, result of my work so far. Um, so to the left, I'm showing survival on the y-axis and on the x-axis time. And um, the red lines and blue lines denote the end of the egg stage and the end of the yolk sac stage, which I haven't gone into details. Um, if you're interested, you can look at my dissertation, but these are basically temperature dependent. What we can see is that the model estimates two main mortality events. The first is during the egg hatching stage. This is consistent with aquaculture studies. We know that even under ideal temperatures, not all 100% of eggs hatch. So, we so there's a loss of individuals during that period. Then there's also a um, strong decline of um, survival in the critical period. And what you'll note is that this critical period estimated by the model agrees strikingly well with theory. If you look off to the right, you may recall I showed this diagram earlier in the presentation 
which is a, um, this is theoretical larval fish survival, where on the x-axis we have age, y-axis population size, and um, this is showing the classic critical period. So I wanted to see, well, what is driving um, survival in the model? So here I'm showing on the y-axis mortality and on the x-axis age. The red line represents the total mortality, the black line represents starvation, and the blue line represents predation. What you can see is that early on, predation is quite low. This is because um, individuals are small and not, um, not easily detected. You also see that starvation is um, zero. This is because the individuals are in the yolk sac stage, so they, um, they aren't starving. However, once the yolk sac stage finishes, we see this massive increase in starvation, which is um, due to the drop in the critical period, which is what we would expect from theory. Another interesting uh, result for my model is that starvation, which um, starts at about two days post-hatch, um, which occurs due to the onset of exogenous feeding, peaks at about four days post-hatch. This means that it takes about 48 hours for larvae to um, starve, and this closely matches with laboratory feeding studies, which shows about 100% starvation in two days. At eight days post-hatch, predation um, become, starts to become the most important source. So there's this interesting dichotomy of early on, starvation is important, but then for uh, older larvae, predation becomes more important. So here now I'm showing the spatial variability in starvation and predation. Off to the left, we have starvation. Off to the right, we have predation. And here what I've done is I've organized all the particles into quarter degree spatial bins and computed the average mortality to um, within them. As you can see, starvation is very low on the shelf. This is what we would expect. However, in the open ocean Gulf of Mexico and the most oligotrophic regions like the loop current and the western Gulf of Mexico, which is um, commonly influenced by loop current eddies, we see very high starvation. Like in contrast, um, predation is much higher on the shelf and then in the open ocean Gulf of Mexico is lower. Can, uh, we can also take an Eulerian approach to looking at mortality. Here um, I'm showing uh, mortality, I'm showing predation for age 3, age 10, and age 17 individuals. This is useful because it allows us to compare differences uh, between ages at a given grid point. So off to the left, you can see that predation is quite low, but then increases substantially at age 10 and, eight, and age 17. Even um, on the shelf at age three, there's very low predation. However, by age 10, this increases. You can also look at starvation in a similar way. However, because the um, past conditions um, are, are dependent on starvation, I came up with a metric instead to quantify the susceptibility to starvation. So that metric is the food limitation metric, which is the metabolic requirement divided by the assimilation, assimilated ingestion. If this ratio is greater than one, then they're considered food limited. If it's less than one, then they're not food limited. And what you can see at, for an age three individual, most of the Gulf of Mexico is considered food limited. You'll note that um, in the loop current, um, metabolic requirement commonly exceeds assimilated ingestion by an order of magnitude. For, eight, for uh, larvae that are age 10, we see that starvation de or food limitation decreases substantially. However, there are still regions of the Gulf of Mexico that are consistently considered food limited. Their decrease in food limitation is due to the fact that um, they are longer in size, which increases their clearance rates. Now I'm showing some instantaneous fields of food limitation. And what you can see is that for age three individuals, the only um, regions in the open ocean Gulf of Mexico where um, larvae are not predicted to be food limited are associated with these filaments where mesoscale features have entrained high zooplankton um, water off the shelf. You can see this also in the age 10 days post-hatch individuals where um, this high zooplankton water is entrained along the boundary of the loop current and extends almost as far as the Florida Strait. And this suggests that these events may be important for survival of larval tuna. 
It also uh, may suggest, um, may explain why bluefin uh, come to the Gulf of Mexico to spawn instead of going to other regions with similar zooplankton biomass and temperature. So now I wanted to know how does spatial variability in predation and starvation impact survival? So here I'm showing survival to age, to age 10 and to age 17. And so what you can see is that survival is highest in the region that minimizes predation and starvation. For age 10 individuals, this is quite close to the coastline. This is because they have um, high susceptibility to starvation early on. By contrast, when we look at age 17 individuals, survival decreases substantially on the shelf, and this uh, as a result of increased predation. So the main takeaway from this is that zooplankton must be high enough to support first feeding larvae, but low enough to allow survival of older individuals. So back to the questions that are driving my research, what is the relative importance of starvation and predation for larval survival? Starvation, based on our model, is the largest source of mortality for larval tuna. However, survival is ultimately limited by predation of older larvae. What regions of the Gulf of Mexico are favorable for larval survival? We found that survival is highest near the shelf break and this shifts further away as we look at older and older larvae due to the increased risk of predation on the, on the shelf. So now we have the last question, which is how is future climate likely to impact larval survival? So to answer this question, I've um, used downscaled climate simulations. I've um, identified four key mechanisms of how um, future temperature warming could um, impact larval um, tuna. The first is pretty straightforward, which is their bioenergetics. So they could become, um, potentially, they could grow faster and have higher metabolic requirements. Temperature can also influence things like planktonic rates. Um, in the biogeochemical model, this could be things like bacteria remineralization. There's also the potential impact of reduced nutrient flux due to reduced vertical diffusivity as a result of increased stratification. And similarly, there could be reduced nutrient flux as a result of dampened W velocities due to increased stratification. So to include the impact of future climate on this modeling framework that I've developed, um, I'm using output from downscaled climate simulations presented in Leodal, and this includes two simulations using the modular ocean model, or MOM. The first simulation is a late 20th century historical mo model run from 1980 to 1999, and then the second simulation is a late 21st century from 2080 to 2099, which includes um, high greenhouse gas emission scenario. Using these, um, these two simulations, I compute monthly climatologies of temperature and salinity, and then I compute the difference between the two. And I'll be referring to this as a climate adjustment. And that's what you're seeing here for temperature, um, where you can see that on average temperature is projected to increase approximately one and a half degrees. Temperature changes um, are um, not consistent throughout the water column. Here I'm showing some transects um, through the Gulf of Mexico. So to the left we have a zonal transect and to the right we have a meridional transect where on the y-axis we have depth down to 200 meters. What you can see is that um, there's surface warming and there's also temperature changes due to shifts in the thermocline. One of the main takeaways from the Leodal 2015 model is that in future climate, transport by the loop current is estimated to decrease by 20 to 25 percent. And this is, um, this leads to redu reduced warming in the open ocean Gulf of Mexico, particularly to the north. Now I'm showing some Hoff-Muller plots where on the x-axis we have time and on the y-axis again we have depth from 0 to 200. And what you can see is that the greatest temperature change occurs um, during March to July and this overlaps with the spawning period for Atlantic bluefin. So this suggests that the leading impacts of um, future warming are likely to, um, to impact um, bluefin tuna. So we took these, uh, I took these future climate temperature adjustment fields and applied them to our current offline temperature fields using this equation here. It's important to highlight though that this does not impact circulation. So um, 
the actual physics are not changing, just the temperature. But this, um, so this means that we can't directly address the impact of changing stratification on vertical velocities, which was the mechanism number uh, four that I, um, that I outlined. However, this is advantageous because we can uh, isolate just the impact of future temperature change. The adjusted fields were then applied in isolation to each mechanism. So first I applied the temperature adjustment to the biogeochemical rates. And off to the right, you'll see the acronym FCBIO for future climate in, um, bi in the biogeochemical model. And I'll be referring to that for the rest of the talk. Then I also applied temperature and salinity um, adjustments to the surface boundary layer module, the KPP um, formulation, to uh, include um, changes to vertical diffusivity. And I also applied the temperature to the larval fish bioenergetics. And then finally, the future climate simulation contained all three treatments. It's also been hypothesized that spawning in future climate may shift to avoid some of these temperature changes. And to account for this, um, I've applied the temperature change to the larval habitat index that we used to initialize um, the particles. And you can see the effect of this off to the diagram to the right, where on the x-axis, we have day initialized, um, starting from April 1st to June 30th. And on the y-axis, we have the number of particles. So this effectively shifts the release of particles earlier in the year to account for this. So now I'm showing the results of these, um, of these simulations, where on the y-axis, we have survival to post-flexion. On average, in the current climate um, experiment, 0.5% of the individuals survived um, to post flexion However, in future climate, we see that survival decreases substantially. Only 0.39% of individuals survived. We can see that the decreased survival is due to the temperature impact on FC bio and FC KPP experiment. Specifically, this um, was due to lower zooplankton biomass. What you also note is that the temperature impact on the larval bioenergetics were largely compensatory. That uh, was a pretty interesting result from uh, this, these simulations. So now I'm showing the results for the shifted spawning simulations. Again, we see that um, future climate is lower than the current climbing conditions. However, um, our model does suggest that shifted spawning can um, mediate some of the negative impacts of future warming. Again, the decrease in survival is due to temperature impacts on FC bio and FC KPP experiment. It's also interesting to note that now, instead of being neutral, the temperature impact on the uh, laurel fish bioenergetics lead to a positive um, increase in survival. I wanted to look at what, were, what, was change, what was driving these differences in survival between the current climate and future climate. So here I'm showing on the y-axis mortality and on the x-axis age. And the blue lines represent predation and the black lines represent starvation. The dotted lines are future climate and the solid lines are current climate. So what you can see is that predation increases across all ages. This is due to increased growth uh, in length for the larvae as um, they are just slightly larger at a given age in the future climate um, experiment. This also leads to lower starvation for older larvae because they have higher clearance rates. However, starvation was ultimately found to be higher for younger larvae. And this is because the specific metabolic rates increase immediately due to warming, while, whereas the benefits of faster growing um, larvae take some time before they have higher clearance rates. So back to our last question, how is future climate likely to impact larval survival? Survival is likely to be lower. This is due to increased starvation during the critical period, and it's also due to higher predation across all ages. So in some future work, I would like to run experiments with larger shifts in spawning to investigate what degree negative impacts of warming can be avoided. Um, I would also like to include the impact of stratification artificially. Since we don't have high frequency output for, from downscale climate simulations, we could do this by adding a nutrient removal term in the photic zone that is proportional to changes in stratification. I would also like to compare the model estimates of survival uh, to recruitment. We now have 20 years of estimated uh, survival to a given 
age. And I'll note that this range, this was ranged by a factor about two to three, which is, sim is similar to recruitment. And then finally, I would like to apply this modeling framework to other spawning grounds like the Mediterranean. Since this framework that I've developed is mechanistic, it's largely transferable to uh, other spawning regions. So in summary, in chapter one, I developed the first physical biogeochemical model with validated zooplankton biomass for the Gulf of Mexico. In chapter two, I developed the first mechanistic individual-based model of starvation and predation. And then chapter three, I identified avenues in which future climate is likely to impact larval survival. There's four main takeaways from my research. The first is starvation is the greatest source of mortality for larval tuna. The second is predation on older larvae ultimately limits survival. Large shelf presence is likely an important regional characteristic characteristic which explains why bluefin come to the Gulf of Mexico to spawn and it's also uh, could potentially explain why they spawn in the Mediterranean because there's also a large shelf presence there. And then finally survival is likely to decrease in future ocean conditions. So given the interdisciplinary nature of my work I've had the opportunity to work with a large group of people um, the physical ocean modeling configuration, I've help from Eric Chassigne, Steve Mori, Alex Bozek, Sankey Lee, Oliver John. Um, for the biogeochemical modeling configuration, I had help from Mike Stuckel, Victoria Coles, Fabian Gomez. More recently, I'd help um, from in the individual base modeling from Oyvind Fixen and Patricia Reglero. The data um, used to validate this model is obviously incredibly important for my research. Glenn Zapfi provided the CMAP and Mandy Karnowskis provided the CMAP uh, mesozooplankton biomass measurements. Uh, Michael Landry's lab, Karen Self's lab, and Michael, Mike Stuckel's lab provided the ship measurements. Uh, I also had larval data from Estrella Malka and other people at, um, in the Forces Lab at Southeast Fisheries Science Center, along with um, larval data from our rule, Louise Carrion. I would also like to take um, a second to thank my committee who has been just continually um, supportive and encouraging of my research during my five years that I've been here. Um, and I would specifically like to thank my main advisors, Mike Stuckel and Eric Chassigne. In addition to being great scientists, they're also great people and have also just been um, really a joy to work with. I would also like to thank Steve Mori who initially recruited me to Florida State and um, made, made this all essentially happen from the beginning, writing a grant to originally fund my research. And then finally, I would like to thank my family who has supported me um, in my interest in the ocean from a young age. And uh, specifically, I'd like to thank my wife, Rebecca, who has been in the trenches with me for the past few months as I've been writing my dissertation. And with that, I'd like to take questions. Thank you. All right, thanks, Taylor. We've got time for questions for anyone who would like to ask them. Taylor, this is Steve. Great hey, job. Steve. I'm going to say some of these questions for the defense, but since it's silent, um, I'd you like start to start grilling me now. Well, not grill, just uh, yeah, you know, I'm yeah. curious. You, you know, as you may recall, when we started talking about this work, our interest was on GAG. And then as we talked with people at Southeast Fisheries Science Center, they suggested that we look at coastal pelagics. And then eventually your work moved to pelagics, like Atlantic. Yeah. One of the reasons I recall is that it was believed, as your model now shows, that food limitation is likely not to be a factor in coastal areas. Right. Um, and originally your work was specifically focused on food limitation, but then you went and included this extra step of predation, which right. is really interesting. Now that you've done that, I'm wondering if the methodology might be applicable to some of the species we were originally considering. Definitely. So what are your thoughts and what would we need to know about the fish? Yeah, well. So, and tuna, of course, are a very data-rich species. Yes, that's why this was such a things. nice 
project to, to work on, yes. Um, that's a great question. Uh, for coastal plagics, as I've mentioned, advection-based losses are also really important because ultimately they need a substrate to settle to. So um, for modeling some of those species, we would need to know what regions of the shelf are important for their settlement. Um, they face the same um, dangers that larval tuna face, al although they probably have less starvation. Ultimately, as they get larger, their predation uh, risk will increase um, as well. And so they will need to get out of the water column and into sea grasses or into um, some type of substrate that will reduce predation. Just a reminder that if anyone else has questions, you need to unmute yourself before asking the question. Yeah. I mean, it's easier for me to... <laughs> if there are no more questions from the general audience, uh, let's all go ahead and thank Taylor, and then the committee will move to the private defense where we can further question him on his research. Yeah, I'm a geologist, so I, I don't have any questions. Most of that went over my head. But that was a good, was a good defense, buddy. Good luck with your uh, committee there. Appreciate it. Thank you.